Welcome to Journey Through the Gate, your paranormal portal podcast, as we delve into the many questions and wonders brought on by the supernatural experience. What's on the other side of the gate? Let's find out together. Welcome to this side of the gate and tonight we are going to have a little bit of a different flavor. We're going to get a little cryptic, we're going to get a little UFO, we're going to get a little ghostly up in here because tonight I have a gentleman who is with the UFO Cryptid Investigations and that is a fully self-funded investigative organization based in San Antonio, Texas. Now, they conduct grounded, scientific, and discreet investigations into UFO and cryptid sightings in the greater San Antonio area. He is also the host of the Conspire a Theory podcast. Now, that's right. I have Mr. Chris Holm. Please come into this side of the gate and walk us through. Chris, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, Cisco. How are you doing? Oh, and by the way, congratulations on your and Steve's new book. Thank you. I'm looking forward to grabbing myself a copy. Oh, we're so excited about it. People are really liking it. It took us years to put it together just between the two of us. And thank you so much. Um, I hope you get it and enjoy it. It should be out on paperback this week. Right now it's in Kindle. So I hope you enjoy it. Let us know. We're very excited oh, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's no short and, undertaking, let me tell you. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, try, especially trying to do it. He's in Portland, Oregon, and I'm here in New Jersey, so it gets a little crazy. It would have been easier if we could have been together, you know, to do it. So it's something. And just, you know, you know as well as I do, just doing a podcast on your own. You know, yeah. just you don't have a room full of producers and people making phone calls and setting appointments and, you know, you try to get all this stuff together. That's an undertaking in and of itself. So congratulations on yours. I really, I really like your podcast and I like, yeah. the, I like the different people you talk to. You kind of mix it up a little, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. And and just to clarify, I'm a supporting member of the Cryptid UFO group, uh, apparently dealing with the, the the responsibilities of the podcast and what was needed to, to support the group. Uh, it's probably best that I just step back as a supportive member, but they can they can always come to me whenever they need anything, and I will always be there to support them as well, which is why I'm willing to come on here and speak about, you know, what it is that the group has done so far. And if anyone has any questions, they can either reach out to the group on Facebook and, you know, you'll be providing a Facebook link to them. Yes. And you can even come to me and, and my group. And if anyone has any stories, most oftentimes what we do in, in the group is right now, the group is just taking in accounts. And if people want an investigation, they can have one. But most of the time, is what the group is learning is that a lot of people, they just want someone to tell their story to yeah. rather than just, you know, getting a full blown investigation there. Are, sometimes people, you know, it's like, I don't, I'm not going to say they don't, they don't want an answer. It's more like, I just need to get this off my chest. I need to tell someone. Yeah. And as far as we know in the group's research, there was no, cryptid group in San Antonio. There are individual cryptid hunters. There's a, a Ken Gerhard lives in the city and a number of uh, smaller independent crypto uh, zoologist people and stuff in the Texas area, such as Lyle Blackburn and all that such and stuff. Right. But within the immediate city, there was really no place for people to go to report cryptid sightings. And uh, in addition, UFO sightings other than uh, MUFON and MUFON, although it is a, you know, the MUFON as a whole is a very um, admirable group that had, you know, started out as, you know, taking reports and it is great for um, sending in reports and retrieving data and stuff like that. But such a large group over time, unfortunately, has had difficulty keeping up in this modern age. And that's not a slight against them. It's just a simply uh, each individual chapter is sort of run, is pretty much independent. 
and oftentimes, you know, uh, MUFON was really the only game in town. And what Cryptid UFO Investigations provides is, you know, not not so much an alternative, but a companion to a safe space for people to go to uh, report and tell someone just to get stuff off their chest right. without the uh, ridicule factor. There's a strictly no ridicule factor. I mean, uh, everybody may have their own opinions, but in reference to the individual investigations, we just want to hear the stories. We may ask a couple questions. And if you choose to get an investigation, you know, uh, the individual will be privately, you know, shared their conclusion. Mm -hmm. But it's basically just a place, you know, you come here, you're going to get hurt, hurt out. And it's had a very positive uh, response from the community so far. And that's, you know, what any community can hope for is to, right. you know, just know that there's someone there to be their friend. Yeah. And with the cryptid and the UFO stuff, there just wasn't. You know, there just, again, wasn't a place to go. Uh, San Antonio is most often known as one of the most haunted cities in America. Muhahaha. <laughs> you know, that that's just, it's our shtick. We yeah. can't help it. Right. We have so many haunted hotels in the city, and there are so many uh, individual paranormal groups in the city that you could throw a rock and you'll hit three of them. <laughs> and that's just how it, that's just how it works. And there is tremendous uh, paranormal support, but this was more of a niche that we noticed that there was an absence, and so the group decided to come together and um, provide support for that venue specifically. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, you know, really cool that, you know, you guys are doing that, um, and I'm sure there's others that are around that just deal with that too, um, but, you know, Texas, wow, you know, um, I'm just yeah, sitting here huge. trying to think, yeah, uh, you know, I lived in Alabama. And now, listen, if, if if you're a listener and you've lived in, you know, basically the same state for most of your life or just moved over to the next state over or something like that, you've not experienced um, a major move. Uh, um, now, I've just gone within the United States, but just going from New Jersey to Alabama, the skyline is so different. The sky is different. The stars are different. It's clear that really is true. You know, the skies are so blue and so clear. And I was just amazed by that. And I'm imagining what it's like in Texas. I imagine there's quite a few sightings out there. You know, just being able to see so much better in the wide open. Um, or do you you feel the same way? I mean, do you think, have you pretty much been in Texas most of your life? Or have you moved around or... Uh, like yourself, I was a military brat when okay. I was growing up, but San Antonio has been my primary home. Okay. Uh, it's where I grew up. And then when my dad retired from the military, it's where he settled down. Uh, he's retired in another city that's like close by, but I've decided to settle my roots in uh, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much, you know, it, it's like, I would have to say it, it's a part of me. It's right. It's a bit of pride, like, you know, like Spider-Man with New York <laughs> yeah. or Batman with Gotham. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. San Antonio is my, you know, central city. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd have to say is that, you know, there, there's just so much potential for for everything in this city. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we love our paranormal. We love our horror there. Mm -hmm. And again, like I was talking about the paranormal groups, if you want horror fests, oh, you yeah. come to San Antonio. We wow. love horror so much. And Texas is so large. Yeah. There's just so much that encompasses it. Right. I mean, I kid you not, you can drive, you know, 10 hours in any direction and you'll still be in Texas. Still be in Texas, yeah. I think it takes from, from one end to the other. It takes about, I, I'm guessing, about like maybe 14 hours off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And every single city sort of has its own like little niche of yeah. its own little like ecosystem of, 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 of just so much going on culturally. And, you know, Texas is so huge, but again, it is, you know, it is a very large area. We have, you know, so much going on here. One of my friends joked with me is that like the only time that he felt like he was ever outside of Texas was when he went up to Ohio for a camping trip. And it's like, oh, finally, forest and stuff, a landscape that feels completely different. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, that's just but it. There's... You know, you can move, go from one state to another and, and everything is completely different. I was just talking with my son about that. It's so funny how you could just, just jump in a line, you know, I mean, laws yeah. are going to be different. This is going to, you know, all the, <laughs> all the regular stuff you can think of, but actually things start looking different. You know, the trees, yeah. these different kind of trees and definitely the skies. So, you know, mm -hmm. and different places might have a different draw for things too. And I'm wondering <laughs> if, you know, UFOs and things like that, you know how like they say, uh, you'll see more hauntings and more ghosts in places with a lot of quartz or a lot of limestone or, you know, water, of course, water, but, um, things like that. And I'm wondering if certain, um, states don't have that. I mean, of course, in the desert, you're going to see so much more, um, and have a lot of yeah. things happen. And I'm wondering if Texas, cause I'm hearing so much about Texas, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Texas is just, it's so Texas Yeah, that we're, we're just... <laughs> We we yeah. have our own attitude. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. You know the the old saying, "Don't mess with Texas," which right. was an anti littering campaign. It's practically the state motto. Mm -hmm. Definitely changed. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting to know. I didn't know that it was. Uh, it makes sense that it was an anti littering campaign. Wow, yeah. that's something. It's yeah. I mean, with with we have again so much in Texas, and we have so many land lakes, and uh, I think out of all of our land lakes, they're all like all of them are like artificial. We only have one natural lake <laughs> lake in the in the entire state. Wow. Um, and about that, you know, it's just as far as you know stuff that maybe uh, could, could be, uh, fruitful for the, for maybe, uh, I guess what we would call residual hauntings or, or what would, uh, I don't know if it's intelligent or residual hauntings. I know those are two different types of hauntings. Uh -huh. And as you were alluding to, uh, limestone and, and I don't know the geological deposits of Texas, but we have a lot of quarries here Yeah, and we have so much that we, that we've even opened up a couple mall strip malls in a few of them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them do have that lore yeah. of, you know, of being haunted mm -hmm. and several um, investigate independent investigative groups have gone into quarries and have had, you know, various experiences. They might not have been what they set out for or what the lore dictated. Right. But they have had some high, strange, anomalous activity. Mm -hmm. One I can recall is the uh, Russell... Russell Rush Hour, which is a morning DJ, uh, he had uh, a paranormal team go out to one of the quarries, and they they had heard lore of where you know a woman had, you know, married a worker and the father didn't approve of it, so she blew herself up with dynamite or something. Oh there was God. some sort of thing where where she was buried in the quarry, and they go out there, they go looking, and even though they didn't get that specific, they didn't contact any type of spirits like that. I don't know if they did. But they had evidence of where you can see on one of their cameras, you can see the, a flashlight in the background start to to move on its own. Mm. And this isn't from, you know, this isn't from uh, like like a wind or anything. There was no wind. There was nothing to right. move. As far as we can tell, there was nothing, no external thing to move that that flashlight. But it moved on the own. And the entire team missed it because, you know, their eyes were off. They were looking off in the corner for something else. Wow. But something else happened right under their nose, and that just <laughs> yeah, it it's just it's, it's the something. Way it usually it, is, yeah, something. that's the way it usually <laughs> is. It's funny, um, you know, we were talking before the show about you know personal experiences and things like that that we've had, and it it usually is when you're not expecting it. I mean, it's hard to go on an investigation and not be expecting something. But, um, you know, I've found that, you know, a lot of the the uh, people that have been in it a while are starting to get to, they kind of settle down and they kind of go in and they just get real quiet at first and just get a feel for the place and, you know, kind of let happen what's going to happen um, and then go back and if they don't see it right away, go back and they start finding things like that, you know, that they didn't even see it was happening behind them. It's almost like they're being played with kind of like we're going to mm. do something but we're not going to do it right in front of you you know kind of thing i don't know if that's intentional um that's the that's the thing about this um whole paranormal subject i mean you could talk about 
you know, whether it be aliens or cryptids and, you know, we, we're, we're very big on putting things in, in nice, neat little labeled files and then being able to put yeah. that in a file cabinet and then say, okay, yeah, that categorizing was, everything. Yeah, everything. And I, you know, that's just something that you can't do. So here's one that maybe you can help me with. I was trying to, um, you know how people do these face, Facebook lives and I had a, my friend Brian was, um, he's on, uh, I think the New York, I forget what it's called now. All these groups have so many different names. You know, the, the, a lot of them are acronyms, and I have no clue what his stands for because it's a long one. But it does mm-hmm. have to do with Bigfoot and 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 things like that. So the gentleman that he was talking to was on, and I said, ask him about this because I saw when I was in Alabama, and it was basically on the Alabama-Tennessee border because I lived right on the border. I could, you know, my front porch was almost in Tennessee, and I lived in Alabama. That's how close to the border we were. So when Mm. I used to drive home, it would be through a lot of country, very rural, and it would be, you know, usually during harvest season, you know, you're going by, and there's a cornfield on both sides of you. So when you're driving down these roads, you know, it's just barely enough for two cars to pass, you know. And you're always on guard because you don't know if something's going to come running out of the corn. And, you know, that can be kind of spooky. (laughs) You get used to it, but not Mm -hmm. really. You don't know whether it's going to be a deer. Or, you know, something else running out, you know, it could be kids mm-hmm. just, you know, smoking weed out in the weeds, you know, and running mm-hmm. and chasing each other. So you're kind of on guard. Well, I'm driving by and at this time I had my son, I believe he was 10 at the time, and he's in the passenger seat and corn on both sides. High, high corn. And I started to get a really weird feeling. And it, the only way I can describe it is I was expecting something to jump out. And I didn't know whether it was, like I said, a deer coming or what. So I was kind of on guard. And then all of a sudden, it got stronger. And as I go by, they're in the break of the corn, standing right at the edge of the corn. I started getting this really overwhelmingly, and I'm sensitive empath. So basically, I mm-hmm. pick up feelings. And I'm starting to get this very overwhelmingly sad, depression, kind of lonely fear. I don't know how to explain that. Um, and it was getting stronger. And as I passed, I'd have to say that this thing was probably, okay, it was taller than the car. I'm going to say it was at least five foot, maybe not six foot, maybe five foot tall, maybe a little more. It was brownish gray, very furry. I would say it was a Bigfoot, but I didn't see its feet. So, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? (laughs) But, you know, if you were to describe your average look of a Bigfoot, that would be it, but a, but smaller, like a maybe a baby, maybe younger. I don't know. Yeah, I, I've I've heard of juveniles yeah. being sighted. I don't I I don't know. So, but it was the face was kind of just like you'd expect it to be. You know, not not so much ape like, but more kind of sort of cross between you know that and maybe human like. You know, um, but you're going by. Now, I wasn't going by fast, but even twenty five miles an hour is fast when you're passing something. My mm-hmm. first thing is now, now I'm a mom and my kid is between me and it. So what is your first thing as a parent? You're going to go faster and go by. You're not going to stop by and ask it questions or take pictures. You know, you just not, yeah. you're getting out of there because it's, but my son is between me and it. But as I went yeah, by. Yeah, the old classic mama bear instinct oh, kicks yeah. in. Oh yeah. So it's just like, say, imagine passing a hitchhiker. You always, when you're passing a hitchhiker, whether they're standing there holding their thumb out or whether they're just walking, you know, or walking, you know, pedestrian. You always get a little flash of face. You know, you always get that little bit of a flash of, you know, your your you focus on their face. And that's what I did with this thing. And his the sadness that just radiated from this animal. I mean, I have that with other animals too, so I'm going to say animal kind of thing. Um it's just so sad. And his bottom lip was if you took some and just did like a big, an over um, expressive pout, like a big, huge mm. bottom lip, almost like pouting, really. Mm. And I went by, and it's looking directly at us and watching us as we go by. Um, long arms. The face was not covered in fur. It was very like a, you know, like I said, like a gorilla kind of thing would be, you know, where it's very furry, but the fur stops. Um, mm. And I just kept going. Now, I was asking this gentleman on the Facebook Live, I'm like, ask him about the big lip, 
because I've seen sketches of Bigfoot. We've all seen sketches. We've all seen like our, you know, the pictures that are out there or whatever they are. Um, didn't seem to have that protruding big lip, but it could have just been sad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, because that's what I was picking up from it. I don't know. Now, somebody else told me there was another cryptid that did match that description that was in or in and around the Tennessee area. Don't have a clue. All I know is that I know what I saw, and I didn't go mm-hmm. back to check on it because I saw a lot of weird things in the in you know the woods in Tennessee. Out, you know, I hung a lot of powwows, did a lot of Native American stuff. You know, and I talked to the elders out there, and they, you know, they're not going to tell you everything. You know, they just tell mm-hmm. you don't go, don't go there, and you don't go there. You know, I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, and if you if you ever been out in the woods and you had that feeling and you just stop. And all the sound goes out of everything and you're kind of like, okay, I'm not supposed to be here. And you back up and leave. There's a lot of that out there. A lot of that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I've I had that feeling that. in the city as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's different kind of, isn't it? I mean, it's the same, but yeah. it's different. Yeah. It's that, that, that sort of overwhelming feeling of, you know, I, I shouldn't be right, here. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, when you're out in the woods or, um. Like, you know, we used to go a uh, big place out there is Montesano Mountain. And I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous because you can go up to certain parts of that and look out over the cliff and look out just miles and won't see anything, not a cell tower or, you know, a house. or and It's just absolutely gorgeous. And you just connect with nature. And it's just a really cool place to go. And I've been up there and you're halfway through your day and you've got this big thing planned or trail that you're walking or whatever. And it's just all of a sudden all of the it's almost like you've walked into some kind of a vacuum i mean you don't hear, yeah. you don't hear birds you don't hear wind you don't, nothing and everything just kind yeah. of the atmosphere changes that's what i'm talking mm-hmm. about you're just like well, something's up back up yeah i've heard of those i've heard of that kind of a uh, like um that sort of an encounter where it's just like everything just cancels out yes and all you just have is just you just you're just running on on feeling mm-hmm. like all the other senses just dull out com- almost completely yeah and that that's an account that's a phenomenon that i hear you know over and over again mm-hmm. and you know is that is that the creature is causing it somehow is that the cryptids or whatever entity is causing that mm. or is that just our own protective nature saying hey you know a uh, threat is nearby mm-hmm. uh, you know we, you you better buckle down right or, or something as such because we're you know so, something that we tend to forget sometimes is we're still animals true uh yeah we're still you know creatures and, and stuff like that i mean we may call ourselves civilized we may put up structures and tall buildings and mm-hmm. we have our iphones and our ipads but you know like any other animal you know we we still you know we still have you know primary drives of sex food mm-hmm. and and survival and just yeah, yeah sex food and shelter mm-hmm. and it's just you know, it, it, those old traits, you know, I can understand them coming back every now and then, Sure. you know, just as, as pure survival instinct, you've heard stories of children getting lost in the woods and then they're able to survive until they're found like maybe five, six, seven days later. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't know how they did it, but it's just that, that internal animalistic survival instinct kicks in. Right. And, and, you know, it's just, I, I think all of us, you know, may have that innate nature, but whether or not we're able to focus on it. Yeah. And that's why I have this sort of personal theory of, you know, maybe uh, psychic behavior is just whatever genome that's triggered for, uh, you know, uh, for, I, I guess, either be it empathy or some sort of external sensory uh, perception is just, you know, is just beefed up or, or turned way up in that particular moment. Yeah, because I'm I'm pretty sure that you know all of us, you know, it's I do believe that all of us can be very skillful at stuff. It just takes mm-hmm. practice, sure. and some of us just don't have that knack for it. And you know that that's okay. But with enough practice, anyone can do anything. Yeah, it's true. And you know, a lot of us too, um, or you know what, like, use your in, 
natural intuitive sense your gut instinct more too and the more you use it the more tuned it is i mean that's just the way it is just like any muscle that you you exercise and i think once you're out there if you're camping you know you're more aware or if you're just walking a trail um maybe that tunes in a little bit maybe we go back to you know that natural instinct a little bit better i don't know but i when you said earlier is it the creature or entity putting it off or is it us you know what if it's both you know mm. we're both kind of aware cuz i mean isn't the rabbit kind of aware of the hawk and the hawk is aware of the rabbit do you see what i'm yeah. saying so is it something along those lines cuz i know just in my backyard i can tell by the squirrels you know, okay, the hawk's out there, you know, let me, <laughs> let me get out there because, you know, I, I, I'm so, I love animals so much. I think there's so much because that's just my natural native instinct. But I had no idea a chickadee had something like 27 different warning signals, not just for other chickadees, but for other animals. It's amazing how, you know, and it, it, it'll be like for an owl or it'll be for a hawk or it'll be for like a, a house cat or something on the ground to look for. I had no clue. And if you start to listen and squirrels too, and you can hear them almost answering back, everybody's warning each other that this predator is in, you know, and around. I'm wondering if that happens, you know, for humans too, in in some ways. You know, that that, that's a signal for us that there's something out there. I don't know. But how many Mm -hmm. different UFO or encounters with, let's just say, aliens or extraterrestrials where the people had a feeling first, you know, before they saw the craft, before they saw the, you know, whatever it was they saw. Are you getting reports where they had that? Go ahead. I can tell you one. I can tell you one off the top of my head. That's pretty much the prominent and first one was Barney Hill. Barney oh, yeah. Hill, when he was driving down that street, he had this intense, overwhelming sense of terror, mm-hmm. and this was before he saw anything. Mm-hmm. And then when he got out and he looked up through the his binoculars, and he saw what what he looked what what to him looked like uh, people in Nazi uniforms. You know, he he was you know he was awestruck in terror. And the thing is, he was a soldier actually fighting the Nazis before, so he had been in that place before. He, that was familiar to him. Mm-hmm. He knew what was going on, and even then, he was still, you know, overwhelmed. But it was just he—he he sort of had that fight or flight response, and he chose to 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 fl- to flight. He chose flight, mm-hmm. and he tried to, you know, of course, escape with his wife. But of course, we know how that story ended. Right. right. But it's just, it's just, you know, he was one of the, well, one of the first that we know of before we start, before we started, you know, documenting this mm-hmm. as a legit phenomenon. And mm-hmm. his encounter was, you know, he had that, he had the vibe right out there. See, that's interesting because you know you wonder. Um, you know, with any of this, you know, whether it be like black eyed kids, you know, what if we, what if I let them in? You know, we don't know. No, I love black eyed kids. I, know. I cannot get enough black eyed kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what if we let them in? Well, listen, I've got an interesting theory about that. I really, really think, and again, I'm, you know, no expert. I don't think there's any really out there. There's experts in certain subjects, but, you know, I just, I keep connecting with these stories where, I don't know, maybe you've heard heard the ones I've heard and, and maybe not, but I'm very interested in the ones, I love the ones from um, police officers, uh, first responders, things like that too, because they seem to get a lot of detail, you know, because they're trained to get that detail, you know, whether it be military or whatever, that's just something we're trained to do. But I keep hearing about this kind of um, boom, this sound. Okay, Mm. like, and it reminds me of when I was a kid when they were testing a lot of jets, you know, back then, and you know they'd break the sound barrier and hear that sonic boom. I think that they're 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 leaving here and going into another dimension. You know, it's like they're there, they disappear, they're there, and then all of a sudden they're gone, and the people keep hearing this sound, this boom. Have you heard anything about that? I've heard of. Phantom booms, mm-hmm. but as far as it being related or cross referenced with other high strangeness in the area, I don't know that anyone has made that connection yet. Okay, because I'm uh, hearing that with the black-eyed kids. Yeah, that's you something know. that we'd have to we'd have to look into that if it's like like you said, like done with the black-eyed kids. 
And that that's completely understandable. I remember back in, I was reading this book. It was uh, one of Nick Redfern's books, The Women in Black. Right. And this one guy, I think it was, uh, I forgot what it was. It was in 19, it was, it was the early, early, the mid, the, the. Uh, Are you talking about the was, early one with the scream? I want to say maybe in the 60s. Okay. 60s or sometime. Okay. He, Either he had an encounter or he was interviewing someone about a UFO sighting. Okay. And he had a woman in black come up to him and, you know, interview him. And he guys just got this eerie feeling from her, like she's just not from around here. And then, you know, once she and then she took she stole his pen and and she said, you know, I don't know if she said, Can I have this pen? or if she said, I'm taking this pen. But still it was it was very ominous that that you know, he felt if he didn't let her have that pin, that, that would be the end of him because of how intimidated he was right, by right, this woman. Right. That's a feeling and, that you're and, getting off of him. Yeah. That's And incredible. she just took it. She took it and she left. Yeah. And then like 30 minutes later, he heard this extremely loud cackling scream. Ooh. And because of what I think he was in uh, in Europe. So at that time, they attri- they would attribute that to the Banshee. Right. So that he believes that's what he encountered was a banshee. Okay. Well, it could, and that, yeah. you know, who's to say? But the one I thought mm-hmm. you were going to bring up, it wasn't Nick Redfern, I don't believe. I think it was, oh gosh, Weatherly, David Weatherly. And, oh, yeah. You know, he I was, got one of his books. Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love David. Um, he, he was describing one because I remember somebody asked him, well, when did the Black Eyed Kids thing start? Did it start with, you know, the, the the one that we've all heard about where the guy was in the parking lot, oh, yeah. you know, with the movie uh, tickets and, you know, the movie wasn't even playing. And I think that one. And he said, yeah, no, no, Brian, no. Uh, yeah. What's his name? Yeah. 92, I believe it was. Yeah. Creepy. Creepy, creepy yeah. story. Um, but he said, no. He said, once he started really looking into this and he heard about that one boy and he th- said it was more like in the 40s, 1940s. And it was out in the country, which, you know, if you're in a very rural country in 1940s, it's more like the 20s and 30s, you know, because it just, it, it, time kind of stands still. You know, like the Waltons was going on, but it was really during World War II. But, you know, look at how they were living and what they were doing, you know, that kind of situation. And mm-hmm. The boy he this man encountered was standing out by the fence, and I forget about the conversation that they had, but of course he had black eyes, and he kept asking for permission to come up to the house, and the guy wouldn't oh, let yeah. him. You remember? And as he I walked away, one, yeah. he heard that scream, you know, and he said mm-hmm. it wasn't like a bobcat. It wasn't because the guy, the guy grew up in the country. He says, I know what a bobcat sounds like. I know what this sounds like. It was nothing like I'd ever heard before. So we've got the screaming, we've got the booming. You know, and one of the booms I can remember was the gentleman, and I'm going to say he was a police officer. I could be wrong on that. It could have been a fireman, but I'm pretty sure he was a police officer. And it was the story in the Black Eyed Kid story where, um, okay, he comes up to his porch. He's got groceries. He goes in. There's nobody around. He's kind of rural. But, you know, uh, let's say at least he has a lot of property around him that's open. He can see a Mm -hmm. lot around his perimeter, okay? He's Mm -hmm. going up the stairs. He takes his groceries in. His dog is in there. I believe he had a Doberman. Um, He puts his groceries down, says hi to the dog, doorbell, no, knocking on the door. He goes to the door, and these kids are there. Those are the ones that ask, is it food time, which is also Mm. weird. You know how they speak. Is it food time? Who says that? Um, and that's the one where his dog was in the back bedroom, starts barking and running down the hall like he would normally come running down the hall to see who was at the door and stops and skids, you know, before he ever gets halfway down the hall to where the front door is, turns around and goes back under the bed and he t- said it took him a long time to get that dog out from underneath the bed. So now you have an animal reacting to black eyed kids. He hmm. was the one who talked about the boom. And there was another mm. guy in a hotel who uh, talked about hearing a boom like they weren't, he turned around and they were gone. And he heard that boom and he walked out and ran outside to see what the boom was because he didn't know whether it was uh, something, it you know, exploded or, you know, it was louder than just somebody hitting something with a hammer or something along those lines it was more like a boom, you know. Mm. So I don't know. Yeah. That's weird. 
Yeah, what what I find curious about the phenomenon pertaining to the black eyed kids or the just the men in black individuals is well with the black eyed kids, the first thing is they're all like off a little bit. Yep. They're always off. There's something off about them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's either their their clothes are a decade off or how they talk. They don't talk the way mm-hmm. that people talk, mm-hmm. which makes me think it's, you know, this has to be either it could be some sort of, you know, extra it's something else. It's yes. in the realm of other. Yeah. And another thing that I find that is extremely curious is uh, the black eyed men. You, I'm sure you've heard several accounts of the black eyed men where they would uh, intimidate people yes. into uh, not talking about their UFO sightings. Right? right. The men in black. Yeah. They would yeah. even go so far as to say, you know, pressuring people into destroying evidence of, of, mm-hmm of ufo phenomena Mm -hmm. and here's what i find curious the the men in black they'll intimidate you say don't talk about ufos don't talk about uh, about this 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 stuff but as soon as they leave it's like no one comes and says oh by the way don't don't talk about me or anything because (laughs) you know that they they leave that part out yeah because we have all these men in black stories and often it's accompanying, you know, destroyed evidence and stuff like that. Right, it's true. But no one ever says, you know, no black guy, no uh, man us. in black ever says, don't talk about us. It's like, you know, you kind of, you, you left something out. You left something behind. That's weird. I never thought when about you were doing that. that. Yeah, I never yeah, thought it, about it that way. I, it always intrigued me that one story. What was the one with the bell? Was that in Pennsylvania? The bell-shaped mm-hmm. object? That was, you know, that hit the woods and then, you know, a couple people um, talked about it or would have made the phone was call that, before you know you, it, the military of, was uh, there. Could it be uh, Rendlesham, I'm Could have been, could have been, maybe, maybe. But it was, I'm going to say it was back. It was back like, I'm going to say early 60s, late 50s that this happened because um the newsman in town he was just like oh my gosh what a story and he's in there and he's trying to get the story and he's got like he was so psyched up to do this story he had the notes and i i'm gonna say i think i remember seeing a reel to reel so we're going back you know like i said early 60s you know somewhere around in there and um he's got all this he's got the you know the interviews and stuff um, from the people, from the witnesses, because everybody was upset that, you know, all of a sudden the military got there and then they said nothing happened here. And then they see the truck pull away with the big bell shaped object underneath the tarp mm-hmm. on the military truck. And then he's ready to give the story of a lifetime to him. And all of a sudden the men in black come to visit. And the next thing you know, he doesn't do a story. Mm-hmm. You see, that's the one that yeah. gets me too, because he was just so revved up to do it. So it must have took some really convincing to get him to sit on this, you know, and not say mm-hmm. anything. He says, "No, I won't. Ta- I won't talk about it." So it's 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 not just intimidation. There's a real implant of fear and doom there somehow. It's not just you know they come with. <sighs> you know, real credentials of, you know, you're not going to talk about this. It's whether it's hypnotic, you know, or whether it's something else. They're good at bearing stuff and covering tracks. Yes. Except their own, of course. Yeah, which is funny. They're they're good at covering tracks. (laughs) That is a great, that's a great thing. I've never had anybody put it that way before. That's, that's something to think about for sure. So how, you know, with the group that you're involved in or your own um, investigations or studies into this, um, what are you seeing, you know, patterns out there in San Antonio? Are you seeing, are a lot of people seeing the same type of thing or are they seeing a lot of different things as far as say UFOs or any of that ilk right there? Same type of craft, same type of, we're hearing so many different kinds of extraterrestrials. It's not just well, the little we, gray guys anymore. As far as individual, um, ET encounters, I really can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. But as far as UFO encounters, I think we encounter small flaps here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's whatever people come forward with right now We're we're still, we've only been, I I guess we've only been, the group has only been active for about a few months. Okay. So we're still in the gathering stage. Okay. And, and whenever, whenever the group makes an appearance, there, there's always an interactive map where there's there's cryptid posts. There's mm-hmm. you know there's like we we put up a big map. We put pins everywhere. Right. As far as um, UFO sightings, cryptid sightings, you know, just strange stuff. 
And it's it's always right now it's an active and it's it's a growing we're going through growing pains right now, mm-hmm. but it's it's as far as we can tell there's just a lot going up out there. Yeah. And now that people have some place that that they can go to, that you know that that's a bit more uh, personable. Right. You know, it's like stuff just keeps coming in and right. uh, the group keeps growing. Right. And as as far as any you know conclusions or patterns i'd have to i'd have to you know do some research and and ask about that Mm -hmm. but it as far as that i wouldn't be surprised if there were patterns and stuff like that well because multiple sightings you know well what i was going to say is you know like on monday night at 12 o'clock jane saw a black triangle object go over her house and then you know at 1205 john in the next neighborhood he saw one too you know, do you have a lot of that? Or since you've only been doing this a couple months, you probably haven't been able to, to have both of those people come up in that amount of time and contact you, your group. Yeah. That would be amazing. Unless you were at a town meeting where a couple people in that town saw the same thing. I would imagine that's kind of hard. It does take time, mm-hmm. you know, to get yeah, all that Yeah, it, it does through. take time to go through all that data yeah. and to put it together, you know. Yeah. What about yeah. different types of, estro- uh, you know, extraterrestrials, whatever you want to call them as far as aliens, some people just say aliens. Um, how? What are your personal feelings on that? I mean, how many different types have you heard about? I mean, everybody's heard of the greys. But then mm-hmm. you start hearing about these other ones where I'm starting to get the feeling now where people are really thinking that the greys are more worker bees, that there's something else behind that. I heard, seems to me a couple of years ago, I was hearing a lot about these praying mantis type, and then I didn't hear it anymore. Um, you know what I mean? It's just like, what? how many different types have you heard about that you, that you know about that so far? Well, first off, there is this theory out there called the co-creation theory that they take the guise of whatever it is we give them. Wow. That because of our, our mass culture, uh, pop culture, uh, I guess I could call it contamination. Mm-hmm. We have an expectation of what they, you know, quote unquote, they should look like. Okay. So we have to wonder, like, is it really them or is it a screen memory of something that we're giving them? Is it that our our mind cannot process what they truly are, so we give them that clothing? Interesting. Because as something that I've noticed through the early uh, 50s and 60s, I love going through those older accounts because in those times, the uh, entities were so fantastical. Mm -hmm. We had robots. We had men with bubble helmets. We had silver suit guys. We had, you know, Valiant Thor. Uh, We we had, you know, the the space brothers, the skin tight space brothers in in their their skin tight onesies. And we had all this fantastical diversity of what these encounters can you know, what came in from these encounters. And as we sort of, as we're going through the, the, the culture, as we move forward, it seems to be bottlenecking into grays. Mm-hmm. I call it a uh, gray, gray foot, gray, you know, like gentrification, yeah. except it's gray Yeah. <laughs> because so, the grays yeah. are just dominating everything. But as far as I know, I think that's, you know, uh, within I don't know if that's unique to our uh, English speaking culture, mm-hmm. because other other um, other areas, they have different encounters. And some of them, I don't even know if they even register them as aliens. Mm-hmm. They might register them as gin or okay. some sort of, uh, you know, uh, there are just so many explanations for, uh, you know, nighttime uh, bedroom invaders. That's so true. And it, yeah. And it's just, you know, well, you know, we don't know if if those are if that's what that is or if it's a cross pollination of some sort. Mm -hmm. It's just when we go into different cultures. Yeah, we're going to see different entities come up uh, a little bit in those that are unique to those cultures. Mm -hmm. But they sort of stem from the same sort of, you know, they're short. They have big eyes. You know, sometimes they have uniforms, sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I've noticed that because, you know, another thing that we have is we'll, we'll have like a UFO discussion groups and something that's brought up is like, you know, why why is it that sometimes uh, 
you know, grays, they used to wear uniforms. Now they're naked. Yeah. And now now we have like uh, stuff like uh, the praying mantis types or the yes. tall, the tall whites or grays or whatever. They wear robes. It's like, why? Mm -hmm. Why do they wear robes? Mm -hmm. What function does that have? You know, especially in in, in that sense, we're sort of like in, in printing our, you know, because it's it's our social norm to wear clothes. Yes. But as far as, you know, something from someplace else, what is their social norm going to be? Right. You know, we, we can't speak to that because we're putting our perception on it. But as far as the, you know, the others, you know, and they're, you know, wearing robes and stuff, it's like that, that sounds like, could that be, you know, cultural pollution from us or, or could it be that maybe there's that, you know, we're, we're giving them a little bit too much credit and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, cause the idea that these higher beings, these higher beings would have modesty is sort of, you know, it's sort of mm, something doesn't compute there yeah. because if they're all about form and function and logic, then, you know, then they would probably have either some sort of protective, uh, protective equipment, which is understandable, but wearing a robe, a robe, I mean, when have you, Outside of, uh, I can't think of an instant where a robe is necessary outside of ceremonial purposes. Yeah. Unless it's sense. those snuggies that we wear, you know, <laughs> yeah. to curl up by the yeah. fire and watch scary movies. That makes a lot Other of sense. Other than that, you know, and yeah, what purpose true. does it have? Yeah, I've also heard, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I have heard um, what you said, you know, sometimes in uniforms. And now I've heard where it's more like, their skin is almost like, um, like if you can imagine, you know, it's like a pale blue gray or even lighter, almost looking like a chicken muscle, like a chicken, a chicken, uh, tender or something. Their muscles, they can see them so much. So they're obviously not wearing clothes, but they'll have a patch, almost like a patch on their shoulder to hmm. signify like as in military, you know, um, uh, some kind of a stature, yeah. some kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is weird. Some, some form of, and yeah, you know, what of uniform threw me even more. I've had a couple mm. of people tell me belly buttons and I've thought, why would they have a belly button? Think about well, it. Well, yeah, you, you know, but with, you think with about the belly it. button. Yeah. Only something born can yes, have a belly button this is as what far I'm as saying. we know. And how do we know we're not, they're not born? So well, like, I couldn't say anything about it one way or another, but I'm hearing other people say that, you know, and again, I'm not part of a UFO group where I'm hearing multiple stories coming at me. I'm just have a podcast and people send me stories and tell me stories. And, you know, I, sometimes you pull out little things that matches somebody else's that don't, they don't know each other. You know, it's not a story that was put out and then the next day I get some because that you can, you know, just say, okay, that's fine. They're matching theirs to, you know, their story matches to that one. So there are similarities. I'm talking about people that don't know each other and haven't heard each other's stories. And I'm hearing a lot about the spelly button now, which is just kind of weird. Maybe it's just something that stands out to me. So are they born? I mean, you know, and if they're born in a test to be kind of situation, you know, I mean, it's just so, it, it's mind boggling when you start to try to unravel all of this. The other one that gets me a lot is the reptilian. I hear an mm -hmm. awful lot about the reptilian. If you go back to Egyptian times and stuff like that, some of the hieroglyphics really look like that or like that alligator-ish looking reptilian look to some of them. I mean, a lot of these things go way back and there are similarities. Or are we looking at the pictures and trying to find the similarities to match what we're thinking i don't know but it just seems like there's a lot of um that going on you know i i don't yeah. know if there's a race of that's what gets me too is people who put it all just like ghosts put it all in <laughs> one great big group like, so if one does it they all do it if one has this agenda they all have that agenda and it's just not true um, I think they are all, you know, could very well be many different groups out there and they all have a different agenda or a different purpose, different reason for being whatever they're doing. Um, they're not all the same. Like people say, okay, well, if they come, come here, you know, are they going to destroy us? Are they going to do that? And I'm like, gosh, you know, if they're so much more intelligent, you know, obviously more, um, you know, higher on the evolution scale than we're, they could have done it a long time ago. 
you know, so something's got to be going on. And you and I were talking about disclosure too. And you had some interesting points on that. And mine is basically, you know, I, I don't need somebody else to tell me that they're here or they could mm -hmm. be here or that they exist because it just doesn't make any sense that we'd be the only planet with any kind of life or the only dimension with any kind of life. It just doesn't make sense to me that we'd be the only ones. And if so, what a terrible waste of space to quote the movie. So what do you think about all that and disclosure and everything? I think with uh, disclosure, it's one of those issues where, you know, if, if something is going to happen and we all see it, then we all see it. And that's that. But as far as official uh, government disclosure, I, I'm not really hanging my hat on that. Mm -hmm. That's not a hill I'm willing to die on. Mm -hmm. I understand why people are so adamant about it because they have so much emotionally, financially, and personally invested in the phenomenon and in the research of the phenomenon that, that disclosure for them is a form of uh, external validation. It's mm -hmm. official mm -hmm. validation mm -hmm. that, that they're on the right track, that they've done the right thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's look at, like, say, if a Bigfoot body was ever to be, you know, officially found, what's proven, you know, yep, it's a Bigfoot body. Then all the foot researchers, you know, they all can up their prices now because they're no longer kooks. Yeah. They're now validated. official Bigfoot validated researchers. Right. And I, I can understand that. But, you know, in saying that, I'm not trying to diminish uh, any researcher or anyone who has a who puts a very heavy emotional or personal or even financial importance investment in the phenomena, because like them. I, too, want an answer, and I, too, you know, want some official validation. So I completely mm -hmm. understand the hunt for disclosure, but I don't – I really don't put any personal investment into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I agree. I think that that's perfectly put. Um, well, the, see, mine, too, is <sighs> – I've just got so jaded over time of knowing, okay, well, if they're telling us this, then this is going on, you know, or if they're saying this is to distract us from what's really going on over here. You know, I mm. mean, if you think about it like that, you know, like we were talking about the Vatican actually um, saying, you know, coming across and letting a couple of things go that, you know, okay, um, there could be alien life, you know. Um mm. Yeah, you know that and and speaking of the Vatican, that's that's a that's a human construct and institution that we place so much importance into. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, who the Pope is and what he does does not personally affect my life. Yep. So you know him saying or thinking or having an opinion towards anything that doesn't affect me. Uh -huh. But I can understand for a lot of people that is for them, you know, yeah. that is theological validation and they mm -hmm. sort of need that approval because they invested so much into it. Yeah. And I can understand, you know, because with the church, they're 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 struggling with a lot of stuff. And I can understand that they need to roll and change with the times to mm -hmm. remain relevant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, yeah. as I was joke, joking with you earlier, is that, <laughs> you know, of course they're going to say yes to aliens because that's one more person they can pass a collection <laughs> plate to. It's like, let's let the aliens join in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it, and it's, it, it is funny, but it, it seriously, um, Th that's really a large part of it because they say, okay, well, listen, you know, we got to get a little more hip. We got to let get a little more cool. You know, people are really believing in this. Let's, you know, okay. We have a big telescope named Lucifer anyway. So why not, you know, let's do this too. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. It really is crazy. I just don't know. I really think, um, you know, I'm a big Mar Jim Mars fan. I mean, I just, I, I really, um, and he's from Texas, and mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah. really look a didn't lot. He, into didn't he? He just he passed, passed recently. Didn't yes. he? Yes. Yeah. God bless him. Yeah. He. Yeah. He, really he, did. he. I've heard about so much of the impact that he had mm -hmm. on uh, on the community, and mm -hmm. that, that was really sad to see someone who was you know so you know up and at it you yeah. know to pass True like journalist. that. True journalist. True journalist, man. Mm -hmm. He really, really yeah. was. I mean, he really was, and by God, he loved Texas and he believed in it. <laughs> and he he believed in you know in the ways too, and uh, it 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 really made my fondness grow. Him loving it so much had my fondness grow for the people of Texas as well. I mean, the way they. 
handle things and the way they, you know, the beliefs and everything. Um, he's really an admirable uh, human being. He really was. And he really has some fantastic books, um, you know, just uncovering things. And he'll, he'd be the first to say, don't believe me. Research it yourself. Here's the stuff. Go look. Make up your own mind. But um, as far as aliens and all that, and as far as what he he believed and, and taught, I really think that this has been going on a while. I really think that there is, there very well could be a coalition. There very well could be some, some agreements made. Who knows? You know, I mean, look at the Nazis and the Vril Institute and all this other stuff. You know, I mean, it, all this has been going on a long time. So if there, I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I'd be surprised if it, if it, they came out and and proved like none of this is true we are the only thing out here that would surprise me it would not surprise me to say okay you know we have aliens are among us they're here they've been helping us this is where we got the mri stuff from this is where we got this from We're, you know that i absolutely believe i would absolutely be shocked if it wasn't true <laughs> I'd be, well, I'm, in, I'm in that spot if, if i could if i could speak a little externally into the whole phenomenon and take a step back here mm -hmm. is that just because um just because we haven't discovered any external life within our immediate galaxy you know i mean oftentimes the argument is put forward and people have to we we put so much on people's shoulders that if they don't answer yes or no or what we want to hear them say we immediately dismiss them when the pic when the when the picture is so much larger than that mm -hmm. let me give you an example uh for example to say that because that because someone says, well, I don't believe extraterrestrial life is visiting us, that doesn't mean that they're also saying that I don't believe extraterrestrial life exists out in the universe. Mm -hmm. That isn't the same thing, and we need to be careful not to make that jump mm -hmm. to a conclusion on that and and to sort of you know shut people down just right. because we believe that they disagree with what we want to hear that, that isn't true at all, mm -hmm. that life very well could exist out there. Now, the real question is, isn't, does life exist out in the universe? The real question is, is it coming here? The more that we learn about our natural, our natural um, universe, and the more that we learn, the probability becomes much, much smaller because of the vast um, um, no, because of the vast space and our own uh, limits and technology and just simply the science of it that because everything is so far away that the trip to come here and back would require you know it would be uh, a multi generational commitment to do so and it you know it wouldn't be worth the trip just to look at a bunch of you know uh, naked <laughs> naked space apes that that's not going to be worth the trip to to die on a spaceship you know just to get out over here but the 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 overall point is is it something that i've noticed another pattern in the phenomena is the more we learn about our natural world the further the entities tell us they're from and this is not you know i mean as far as where the the ets actually come from I can only go off of what contactees have have said in their experiences. But before, you know, they were they would tell us we're from Venus. Valiant Thor, he said, "I am from Venus." We researched Venus; it's inhospitable as far as we know. And then he said, "Okay, well, we live underground. You know, if there's a base underground, as of right now, we really can't prove that." Mm -hmm. And then everyone said, "Well, we're from Mars." And then the more we learn about our natural world, the further the aliens came from. And then Barney and Betty Hill, we are from uh, Zeta Reticuli or or, or, or Alpha Centauri. Mm -hmm. We're we're from this star here. And then we look into the star and says, are there any hospitable planets there? Uh, we don't know, or, or maybe no, probably not. And now it's gotten to the point that now the, the ETs are telling, oh, we're from the next dimension over. And it's like, you know, this isn't, you know, uh, me saying this in an attempt to, you know, to, 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 to poo-poo on anyone. This is, these are uh, contactee accounts telling us what they were told by the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I just find it so, you know, it's like, I do believe something is happening, mm -hmm. whether or not it's actually ETs or not. I, I really don't know. I, I, there's not enough evidence to make a, a, a grounded conclusion, but from what we've seen, from what we've seen from the anecdotal evidence, it seems the more we learn about our natural world, the further away they're coming from. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. 
That's very interesting. And like you said in the beginning, you know, it could just be, gosh, man, you know, it could be uh, gin, you know, just messing with us. You know, it could be this, it could be that. Well, we may yes. never know. And by the time we get the answer, if we do get answers when we pass, you know, and we go wherever we go, um, mm. then it'll be too late to tell anybody. <laughs> I have to come back through a Ouija <laughs> board and tell you, I found out, here it is. And then again, uh, everybody says, too, that, you know, well, we're not supposed to know. So, <laughs> I mean, I've even heard, like you said earlier, the, you know, the bedroom visitations. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of people, too, think, now, when I say shadow people, I don't mean Aunt Gladys that just manifests as a shadow and comes through. I'm talking about shadow people that everybody's given them that moniker, um, think that they're ancient, in some way and could be alien connected and i've had people that do a lot of work in the paranormal investigation um genre and do a lot of say like battlefield rescue now if you think mm. about battlefield rescue uh for spirits like going in there and trying to see is there any ghosts here that are intelligent that are just confused and need help let's just put that out there that's what i mean by that um, and they say that during the rescue, um, not only other beings come through to try to help, but also alien-like creatures. And I asked the gentleman, mm -hmm. what do you mean alien-like creatures? He said there would be what we would perceive as grays. And then there are the, um, how did he describe it? Let me get it right. A taller, yeah. paler uh, very uh, whitish, almost albino-ish looking. Hmm. Um, yeah. Do you see I what I'm saying? I remember that episode. That's odd. Yeah. And yeah. I thought yeah, that The good, the odd. bad, and the extraterrestrial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that was, that, that's one of my episodes, but that, that wasn't in this. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but uh, we had a long <laughs> conversation on the phone in, um, you know, about that. And he's going, you know, yeah, I see him all the time. And, you know, why wouldn't they come through to help? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's like, I can't say they would or they wouldn't. I don't know, you know. But, you know, if I look at it open-mindedly, it's possible. Or are they doing what you say is possible and just manifesting is that or we're doing it? You know, that's what we're perceiving. Because we know in many cases, uh, this might interest you, um, I had two friends, one was a psychic medium and one was a medium and they were both working on, um, paranormal investigation with a paranormal group that was there with all the tech and everything else. And they were trying to help some homeowners and they'd been having, obviously having issues. So they went in and they did the type of investigation where they wouldn't really talk during the investigation. Everything was stayed quiet. They would take a break go outside and they had like took notes and then they would go outside and compare notes. And that was the tech people as well, because the tech people didn't want to set off thoughts to the mediums. Mediums didn't want to do the opposite. You know, they just kept taking breaks and going outside, regroup. This is what I've found so far, what's linking up with yours and then go back in and do it again, which I thought was an interesting approach um, rather than talking through the whole thing. You know, and then one person setting off somebody else to see something that they normally wouldn't or whatever, or change their attitude or whatever it might be. So they had one entity that they could figure out what it was. And I say entity because I don't know if it was a human being that had passed or if it was something else. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm. The medium psychic was seeing him. They both got the same feeling from this entity. However, he was manifesting to one of them as a young boy like a, mm. a young teenager that was just very angry. The other one saw him as um, an older man who was very angry that also came across, he was trying to put himself as like a grim reaper. He would change back and forth to her. Mm. But they felt like it was the same one and then over time and a couple of days of going back they didn't just do one they went back several times they found out it was the same guy manifesting um to two different people at the same time in two different ways now that mm. and it turned out to be a human so that's what they said but i don't know now if we if we can do that 
can you imagine something else who's been around thousands of years <laughs> or whatever? So, I mean, that just mm-hmm. blows my mind. So when I think of that story, gosh, it's anything we're seeing. Can we count on anything we're seeing? <laughs> you know what I, I mean? I wonder. Yeah. You know. Well, the thing is, the thing is, if it's an external presence, like an entity or something, and we're just picking up on it, and we discover that that's the case, that that we're just locking into the frequencies of of interdimensional beings, that's a fascinating discovery. Mm-hmm. If it turns out that it's all in our head, that we're uh, somehow hallucinating this, mm-hmm. and this is all happening internally in in our minds, that also is an extremely fascinating discovery Mm -hmm. i mean it it just because just because it's happening to us and we believe it's real Mm -hmm. you know that that doesn't make it you know any less a fascinating experience Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean it it shouldn't you know be uh you know tossed to the race side or or ridiculed saying oh you're imagining it it still needs to be uh studied and and you know and and learned about and because you know a, a lot of the people that have these experiences you know, most of them, they're not fun from mm-hmm. what I've heard. No, yeah. They're, they're not. No. I mean, if we could make up some kind of pill that makes aliens go away or Bigfoot go away, I'd take it. Mm-hmm. You know, if it I mean, if, if we could figure out some type of like, OK, well, if these if these are extraterrestrial beings or whatever, I'm pretty sure in time someone's going to develop some way of of you know, dampening the field so that way, you know, everyone can have an unhaunted house and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. and it's just, you know, but but again, we have to take a look at it. We have to take a, a serious look at it. And right now, I think we're still in the gathering evidence. Oh, sure. And, and, and I do believe that, you know, a lot of, a lot of it, you know, because even though television shows and stuff it sort of makes a mockery of it Mm -hmm. and turns it into you know like it it turns it into a quick money fix Uh but it also is a double-edged sword in that it also brings awareness to it because i i came into this through you know television stuff oh is that you yeah you're not on fire are you no fire alarm went off i don't even know if it was mine wasn't mine Uh, it was probably a Mine usually only uh, goes off when I'm cooking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, you're, you're, as long as you're safe, everything's safe. Do you smell smoke? No. Okay. No, I don't smell. Anything. Okay. Well, if you if you do smell smoke and you need a break, don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So, uh. well, the thing <laughs> is, is um, I was going to ask you what your thought and your take on. I don't know if you know this. Um, Gosh, I wish I could remember the names. It was two, a man and a woman, husband and wife, went out camping in a desert. Mm-hmm. And they were had an abduction. Uh, I don't think they were taken away, though. I think they were just kind of made to stay put. While I guess what they described was a craft came down and it looked to them like they were trying to harvest something out of the ground or get mineral, whatever they were doing. However, they mm-hmm. were in the middle of the desert. Are you familiar with this? And yeah. they, they were held like in the in their van or their camper or whatever, and they went through what the extreme the experience was intense, of course, um, extreme pain. Um, the woman was real worried about the guy. The guy was, you know, uh, worried about the woman. And at one point in time, uh, you have an on, issue. Me, sure, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let check me, let it. Me take a break. Okay, he's back. There's no fire in his home, as far as he can tell. <laughs> Okay, um, so if you're familiar with the thing, and I don't even know why this woman was in so much pain. I don't know if they were trying to subdue her telepathically, if they did some kind of a, you know, a thing to just subdue them, and that was what it was because they were trying to fight back. I don't recall this, them doing is, any is, kind of... Is this the... Hang on, let me... Go ahead. Is this the one where they saw like a goblin-like creature outside? I think so, yeah. They kept seeing... Yeah. Everything kept changing what they were seeing. Um, the thing, the reason I brought it up was I remember the woman was very distraught and this went on for hours apparently. And at one point in time through the van window, she was getting from this one alien. I believe this one was very similar to a gray. I could be wrong, but the mm-hmm. description and it was kind of sending her the message like, this is all going to be over soon. Don't worry. You know, uh, 
that kind of feeling being sent to her. And then all of a sudden, manifested outside of her window, she saw this bright light and what appeared to her to be an angel. And she said, mm. everything just became more calm. Um, the, you know, the warmth, everything that she just felt like everything was going to be okay. Cause here comes this angel. Now she perceived it from her own words that it was an angel that came to protect her. This is from her words. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they don't just, you know, if the, the alien just didn't realize that by seeing that, and they maybe projected a hologram of some sort, what we would call it for lack of a better term, to calm her. And to me, that kind of fits with what we were talking about before. Like, you know, why don't they, why can't they just show us what we want to see to get us to do whatever it is they need us to do? In some cases, they don't even bother with that because in a lot of cases, it's just, you know, we're here to do a job. It's basically like tagging dolphins and just checking them out yeah, and yeah. letting them go. Yeah, just a, a smash and grab. Yeah, exactly. Um, why it would at this point show some kind of a feeling like, okay, what we're doing is not working. Um, I don't know why they just didn't like knock them out. And maybe they did and they woke up. I can't remember. But why go to that trouble? Ian, yeah, they probably ne they probably needed them conscious for some whatever reason for yeah. some space alien reason. Space alien reason, that makes yeah. perfect sense. But you see what I'm saying though, as far as bringing that up, as far as the hologram. So if they could do something like that, mm. like just like I said, this human entity that appeared to be two different things, actually two different things to one medium psychic and then to the other at the same time. Mm -hmm. what is the what you know the possibility of what an extraterrestrial could do you see yeah. that's what blows my mind and i don't know if in the field um the reason that um, and i wish i could remember his name um was telling me about the aliens coming to help with the rescue was the point was um a lot of people don't think about this but when you have a battlefield um and you have that much death and you have that much any massacre uh, you know, of any kind, it doesn't have to be a battlefield. But now you've got all different types of ghosts. You've got, you know, the wind remembers, the rock remembers, the land remembers, you've got your residual, you've got your echo, you know, whatever you want to call it, your repeat playbacks. Mm -hmm. You've got your uh, intelligent ghosts that are just repeating things, maybe caught in your death state. Then you've got the ones that have no, you know, they have no clue that they're dead. They're just repeating whatever it is they're repeating for their own reason, maybe in their own little jail that, you know, that they've set up for themselves, however you want to explain that. And then you've got the ones that are kind of aware that they're dead and they're not going across because they don't feel like, you know, they don't, for whatever reason, you've got a whole mixture there. But there's suffering and there's still pain and there's still, a, to a large degree, if they're repeating things over and over again, then there's these entities that feed off of that energy, the mm. suffering, the pain, the agony, and they don't want you to get them. You don't, they don't want you to stop that. You know, that's basically their food. It's like a buffet. It's an all you can eat buffet. It's soul food. So mm -hmm. they don't want that to happen. So at this point in time, when this man is trying to do this, this is when these other, what he says, extraterrestrial as mixed in with other things come and help because they have to hold these other things back. And I've just found it amazingly mm. interesting, you see. So that's kind of cool. And I, that's not the only time I've ever heard aliens and ghosts and all this stuff mixed. I mean, if you talk to, you know, if you ever listen to Rosemary Ellen Guiley or, you know, some of the other people, they'll tell you that as well, that there's a mixture of these things. Now, is it the gin? You know, sometimes you can talk to people and say, all right, the, the gin is all of it. They're, you know, they're, they're all of it. They're the aliens or this or that, they're the shadow people. It could very well be. Um, I don't know. I mean, how do you feel about all that? It's a lot, mm. I know. Yeah. I, <laughs> a big basket of yarn. Go ahead and unravel that one. <laughs> at, at, as far as that uh, one woman's um, encounter, it's it's not uncommon that I've heard where when these people have encounters with these beings, whatever it is, they they found ways to uh, sedate us, mm -hmm. and oftentimes, I remember during the Pascagoula 
event that the the man who had experienced that Calvin he had just recently released a book and he had spoken about it where when the when the when the entities came up to him they grabbed him by the arm and they pinched him like really hard and in that and in that they somehow released some sort of uh sedative into him mm-hmm that that's that's the best that he can come up with well, and then you know they find some way to sedate people the some of the grays you know when people are experiencing pain during their uh, experiments they'll oftentimes you know tap them on the head and they'll trigger some whatever sensory thing in their lobe to make the pain go away and then they'll say it's going to be okay you're, you're you'll experience no pain mm-hmm. blah 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 and then and I mean, so far, it's like all these these creatures, they have different ways of figuring out how to sedate us. Mm-hmm. It's no different than when we uh, when we get a tiger, we don't want it yeah. to thrash out on us. So we stick it with some good juice and then he's, mm-hmm. you know, he's in tiger heaven. Right. You know, who knows what he's seeing yeah. when when he when when we're like medicaling him up. Yeah. And that's and then, exactly what yeah. it's like, man. That's exactly mm. where it just get tagged and tagged and released. You know, I mean, that's and just and you crazy. know another observation that I can point out is, have you noticed that in the uh, encounter literature and in, in the lore, the aliens are getting better and better at entering uh, people's bedrooms. Yes. Before, they would show up in their spaceship. And they would land and they'd collect dirt samples and they'd say, oh, people, let's run away. And then it came to the part where it's like, well, we've collected all the samples. Let's start collecting the people. Uh-huh. So then they would, they would, you know, pull people out of their cars and stuff like with Betty and Barney Hill. Mm-hmm. And then it got to the point that they would, you know, invade people's homes mm-hmm. where they would, you know, you know, knock down people's homes. I think I remember one case in Russia where that happened, where they, they, they opened the door and they froze everyone inside and just went in and took people out. And the woman, she believed that it was a religious experience that she was having. So she went, she totally went with them and, and, you know, and they didn't fight them in in any sense of the word, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there was another encounter where, you know, they're, they're appearing in people's bedrooms Mm -hmm. in their windows and then they climb in through the window. I I think, I don't know if uh, Whitley Strieber, if I think it was one of his kids uh, had, you know, was terrified of spiders outside of his, his, his bedroom window, um, and then the, and then now it's gotten to the point that they're just they're just oozing in through the walls now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that they're just yeah, and it's this it's this escalation, and yeah. I find it fascinating. You know, yeah, it's either I've their, heard their multiple techno- where they'll lift yeah. them out, either they yeah. come in or they, there's just the bright light where, like, I guess the craft might be over the house, and they'll just lift them out. And like somehow they'll go right through the floor and see everything in the floor, the layers of the floor as they go through. And mm-hmm. then like maybe see the sleeping people upstairs and go through those rooms and then through the roof and right into the craft into the bright light. And I've had them come in through the walls and take the person out the wall and have them see mm-hmm. things in the wall as they go out. I mean, it's just, it, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know that that wasn't happening before and maybe not getting reported. Or if it you know, is that, a natural escalation, like you said, as far as the uh, being further and further away from where they came, if it's, I don't know, but it's fascinating. Yeah. It really is fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, have you ever had your own encounter? What got you started in the UFO? Did you, have, did you see one or is this something that just always fascinated you? Well, luckily, I've, I, as far as I know, I've never had any kind of, you know, aliens come up to me or do anything, mm-hmm. you know, so I, I crossed my figure for that. I'm lucky for that. <laughs> but as far as paranormal stuff, um, I have had bedroom intrusions okay. where I would have uh, sleep paralysis. And this was when I was just a, a, like a, a little bit younger. I would have uh, sleep paralysis episodes. And those were they, they weren't your usual uh, sleep paralysis episode, but my very first, it wasn't my encounter, but it was, to, it was given secondhand from me, from my mother is that we lived in our old house in San Antonio. And when my mom got up, she got up one night to get a drink of water. And when she was going through the hall, she saw someone in the hallway and it was, she described it as a, a sort of a, a standing man or, or woman. It was, it was just a figure. And it was made out of light, and she couldn't see 
like below the knees, like it, it faded below the knees. And it was just standing outside of the bedroom of me and my brother. And, and she like, you know, she jumped, you know, because of suddenly seeing it. And then when she jumped, it disappeared. And of course, from then on, what she would tell us is, you know, that was our guardian angel. Mm. Whenever I would bring anything paranormal to my mom, you know, my mom would just say, oh, that's your guardian angel. And I'm pretty sure that was her way of trying to protect me. Mm-hmm. to like to slap that filter down so that that way I don't get freaked out by any little thing because during my teenage years and during the teenage formative years that's usually when most kids go through this period where they 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 have it called what is it a uh, poltergeist agent mm-hmm. where they where they the whatever energy that they have going on can get channeled into poltergeist activity well I had the hobby of drawing. I would always draw stuff. So I had something to channel whatever poltergeist energy into if I had any. But what I would hear is I would hear someone calling my name. It would and it would be in my mother's voice. And oftentimes I would just go up and say, you know, like, hey Ma, you called what you need. And she's like, I, I didn't call you that. It's your guardian angel. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. But I could always go to her and say that. Right. But one time, one time that I cannot account for was where I was in my bedroom. I was, you know, on my bed, I was drawing cartoons or something. I was probably drawing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and, and I heard my name called. I heard my mom calling me. And usually it's not like, like, you know, like a call for immediate medical attention. It's a call like, you know, I need you to like, uh, like, like, she, like she's summoning me to, to, get the uh, can of peas off the top shelf, something like that. It wasn't anything with any, you know, immediate emergency. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just calling my name, you know, just once. And then I get up and I go into the kitchen and I look for my mom and she's nowhere in the house. So I open up the uh, back, the sliding back door because I look out the back and she's in the, she's in the garden. She's tending to her garden. I open up and in, in these old houses, when you open up that sliding glass door, it makes that loud, crickety noise, that, that loud screeching sound. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes a loud scratching noise. And then I, I say, Mom, you called? And she's like, no, I didn't say nothing. And then I, and then I close the door. And when I think back on that, there was no way for me to have heard her from the backyard because the only way that she would have been able to call me was to open that door because all the windows are all the windows are sealed shut this is an an old house so all the windows are sealed shut there's no way i could hear her if she called me from the garden because then i would have heard her you know it muffled or i wouldn't have heard it at all but the only way that she could have you know made any kind of noise in the house was to open that door Mm. and that puzzled me for the longest time I can imagine, you know, that's just, um, mimicking, you know, I've heard so much about mimicking and in a lot of ways, I mean, I've heard people hearing the voice usually of the mom or someone Mm -hmm. else in the house. And it's that voice, it's their voice, unmistakable. And you react to it and then you find out like you did, there's no way it could have been her. And in some cases I've heard it where it actually kept the person from doing something that was going to harm them. You know, like it kept them from getting in the car and going or it kept them from, you know, doing something else and they found out, okay, um, you know, it kind of helped them out of a situation. And then I've heard it, you know, where it got them into something you know, that was Mm. bad. So there's really no, it's hard to put that one in a category other than, you know, it's something that's mimicking. Um, And what has the power to do that? And isn't that a little scary? It's just creepy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and as far as anything negative happening in that house, I really can't recall it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, there was really nothing bad going on Mm -hmm. as far as I can remember. But as far as my sleep paralysis episode, now these I knew were sleep paralysis because I had studied the phenomenon, the 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 condition of it enough to know that oh okay I'm having an episode I need to will myself out of it, mm-hmm. you know and and before you know uh, like this would have been like a few years ago. What would happen is when most people have sleep paralysis episodes, they would have bedroom intruders, they would have nighttime entities coming into their room and it's either the old hag sitting on their chest Mm -hmm. or 
seeing shadow people in their corners. I didn't get any of that. One episode I got was really fantastical. And then I had two more episodes that were just, uh, they're kind of dumb. It's like I would see it would be daylight and I would see my door open and I would see two people come into my room and they were, you know, as far as I could tell, they were, they, you know, they were burglars and they were white trash. And I would feel, you know, I would feel that fear, but I would know that it, this is a sleep paralysis episode at the time. Maybe I didn't even know it was a sleep paralysis episode, but later I discovered, okay, I just had a, a paralysis episode and they would go through my stuff. And they would look to the, to the bed to see if I was still there, to see if I was moving. And then they'd continue to go through stuff. But what was curious is they would open closets that I didn't have in my Whoa. room. They, they would open closets that, that I didn't have. And it's like, so my mind is imprinting furniture for them to go through that I don't have. That's weird. And and the thing is, the people, they looked like, you, you've been to the website, uh, people of Walmart, Right. Right. That's what they look like. People from that. One of them was like, a, you know, they look like the most white, stereotypical white trash you could see. I think one of them had like a, a plaid shirt on. It was a green and blue and gray plaid shirt with, you know, uh, mutton chops and, and a big burly mustache and all this stuff. And they would just look to me. And, and that happened twice. What, did they do the Another, same thing both times? Yeah, it was just it was just people would come into my room, go through my things. And then and then leave. And then by the time I willed myself to getting up, I would check everything. Nothing was taken. Nothing was moved. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. I would go through. I would go through the rest of my uh, rest of my house, and nothing. Mm -hmm. All my locks were still locked from the inside. Right. Everything was locked, and all the alarms were on. Mm -hmm. I just had an episode. Right. And then uh, and. Uh, and then another episode that I had that was like, I'll go through this real quick. I It was lucid dreaming and sleep paralysis. I was in the middle of a, I was on my mattress in the middle of a Gettysburg battlefield. And I could hear and, and see, I could, I was surrounded by forests and I could see through the trees, you know, uh, the, the fires of a battlefield and stuff like that. And there was this, this person at, the side of my bed it was a woman and she was facing away from me and she was wearing this sort of this uh white nightgown and i could see the back of her hair and she had this long brown curly brown hair and and she was facing away from me and and i tried so hard i reached out to grab her and what happened was i reached out and i grabbed her butt uh -huh. <laughs> and i felt it squish i felt it squish and then as I was coming out of the episode, it turns out what I was grabbing onto was the corner of my mattress. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was, wow. it was, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I know that, you know, that's like, you know, lame duck sauce, but still, no, that's it's not. all I got. It, <laughs> I'm <yeah>. sorry. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, you know, lucid dreaming and the paralysis at the same time. But you grab now we've all had those dreams where, you know, we're fighting off something and, you know, we find out it's, you know, the telephone cord or something that got, you know, wrapped yeah. around us. We thought it was a snake in the dream. That mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. But to me, the guys coming in and rifling through your things, especially things that you're seeing closets that aren't there, that kind of makes because, you know, I'm ghost girl. That kind of almost sounds to me like you may have had this, felt like you were having, it's just a possibility. You felt like you were having a sleep paralysis because in some cases like that, we're meant to be still, especially when things change like that around us. What if that was a replay of something that happened in a past time? Do you see what I mean? We're like, maybe, I don't know. I don't know your house. I don't know if it was the first house that was ever there. I don't know if the, you know, things have been changed in the house where there would have been a closet there. You know, that would be interesting to check out. I mean, it could have very well been, you know, like you could call that either um, a replay, you know, of something that happened. Um, or, or maybe, well, or the, a time the closet. Slip. Yeah, the closet that they opened that wasn't there mm -hmm. would have been, as far as I can call it, in my childhood bedroom. 
So maybe, who knows, maybe I was astral projecting and I was watching my, my, you know, my, or I was going through time and space Mm -hmm. and seeing my, my bedroom, my childhood bedroom being burglarized when I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, in our, in the childhood home that I grew up in, we never experienced a burglary. Mm -hmm. Now I have experienced burglaries at my new place. And I moved into a new place and got new alarm systems and, you know, because I'm ultra super paranoid and stuff Uh like that. So I'm, I got my, I got my butt covered. Okay. But as far as, you know, experiencing, if I, if I, if I repress some kind of memory, uh, as far as I know, I don't think that was the case, Mm -hmm. but maybe if we're going to go out into the outer limits here, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe I saw something. From someone else's perspective, could be, or or maybe I saw something happening someplace else. You know, it yeah. it could have happened like that. All of those things are possible, and that's the wonderful thing about this subject. I can tell you one, mm-hmm. um, two, two that that just makes you go, ugh. I, like Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, and I call this the great paranormal onion because as soon as you peel back a layer and you think I got this one, I got this one. No, it's another layer. You know, it's just <laughs> things keep shifting, but. Mm-hmm. The one, um, a lady moved into a house, a typical story, um, nice family, everything else, but she keeps hearing the sounds of people fighting. Um, at one point in time, she's coming down the hall with the laundry, and she sees this man um, attack this woman. She sees two apparitions, uh, pretty darn clear. Um, I believe she said she could see through them. I could be wrong on that. She might have, they might have been solid to her to the point where she just stopped and just like, what are you going to do? You just, you're dumbfounded by the time you're processing this. The man reaches out, attacks the woman and chokes her. She, the woman falls on the floor. The man runs out the door and then they disappear and things all go back to normal. And that happened to her twice. Mm. And she heard it more often, you know. Um, the struggle. Now she thinks she's got ghosts. So multiple paranormal teams, lots of research and things that found out once they did history on the property and everything else, they find out that a couple of homeowners beforehand, the man and woman had a fight. The husband did choke the wife. That did happen in real life. However, they're both still alive. Hmm. So now, so it's like a yeah, wow. So it's like a like a residual haunting, but they're not dead. Correct. I, I've I've heard of this experience several times where if you walk into a room after people have had a fight, yes. the air just feels thick with anger. Absolutely true. And and it's like it could be something like that, but mm-hmm. at a more profound level. Yes. And maybe somehow she has something where she's able to. To, to channel into that because yeah. the idea of people haunting stuff that or or like I would I don't I don't think haunting is the right word mm-hmm. I think maybe uh, leaving a emotional imprint correct you know, that yeah. that I, I think is something that we need to look into I do too because how many times have you gone to have you sat on the edge of, of a, like a park bench and just watch the sunset right. and you feel all warm and fuzzy and yeah. think how many times have people gone and sat there and felt that same thing? Yeah. And who knows, maybe some of them left that imprint there yeah. and you're just picking up on it. Absolutely. Cause good can, good, you know, good feelings can be left behind as well. Like something is yeah. so good. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the other just one, go to any museum, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, here's another one. Um, I forget exactly where I heard it. I'm pretty sure it was from Steve. Uh, the a gentleman was living in a house. Mm-hmm. Um, another man went back, visited his childhood home, uh, town. You know, he came back like after 30 years or something and came back through nostalgic, you know, wanted to see his old town. Um, got to talking down at the country store or whatever and found out, hey, hey, I live in that house. Um, oh, I'd love to see it. I haven't been back since I was, you know, 10. You know, I used to have so much fun. I love this place. I played in the backyard. You know, the typical all 10-year-old boy, wonderful growing up experience, right? Rode mm-hmm. his bike, played baseball in the back, the whole thing. So he goes in and they're talking and they're walking through the house and he's like, oh, well, this is where this happened and this is my room and this is the yada yada. And throughout conversation, the guy 
you know, ask the man, when you lived here, did you guys ever have anything odd happen? Because he's trying to very carefully bring up the fact that his house is haunted. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to know if they had had any experiences back in the day. And um, he said, no, I don't ever remember anything but good stuff happening here. And he says, well, I'll tell you something. He says, you know, I'll, you know, uh, my wife and I hear um, kids running through the house. We'll hear this, this. And he goes, I keep seeing this young boy. Well, you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. The man goes back. He describes the boy and he says, this is what triggered it. He said, I keep seeing, he says, I've seen him. I, you know, and the guy's just scared, you know, I've mm -hmm. seen him in here and I've seen him in here and I keep <laughs> seeing him climbing in this window and the guy just went sweaty white, you know, right away. And he goes, I, I can't believe you just said that. He goes, well, what do you mean? He goes, I'll tell you what, I'll come back here. Cause he had, he was moving back to the town. So he had all this stuff. He says, I'll, I'll come back here. Do you mind if I come back? I want to show you something. Comes back a couple days later, the guy lets him in and they're having coffee and he starts pulling pictures out of his pocket. He goes, is this the boy you saw? He says, That's him. He goes, that's mm -hmm. me. It's me. I used to come climbing <laughs> in that window because my mom, you know, I would, I would always be late or, you know, my, if I came in that window, I could sneak up to my room. My mom would be in the kitchen. She wouldn't know I had been out in the back doing, you know, run playing with the dog or whatever. He said, I always came in and out that window and that's what triggered it off. So there's another one of the person's perfectly alive. It was a happy experience and it was just something that he left energy behind. So we hmm. don't really know what we're seeing. That's why it kills me. You know, you see, I, I know so many good paranormal investigation groups and, you know, so many people that are just getting into it and just interested and just want to learn. But you have to understand there's so many levels to this and the levels that we've talked about over, you know, the past 30 years, there's levels to that. And then there's levels mm -hmm. that we don't even, can't even possibly perceive. Like you said, the bigger picture, let's back up again, you know, and look and see at this because it's, oh gosh, it's just so interesting. It's just so interesting. Yeah. And it could have been when you saw that, that you were, gosh, there's so many different things. Time slip, you know, like you said, you could have been um, seeing something that was actually in progress or something that had happened or you know, something that, uh, gosh, there's so many. So I guess no matter how much we dig and how, how, um, with so much love and so much interest and so much, you know, just absolute good intention of trying to understand these things, you know, it's just like, I say it all the time. It's like watching an episode of Forensic Files. You think you got it right up until the last 55, you know, the five, 55 minutes of an hour show. And then they bring out that next piece of evidence that blows it all out of the water. <laughs> and that's the way the subject yeah. is. But isn't yeah, that but, interesting? Yeah. The thing that I find interesting about the ghost, ghost hunters and stuff like that. And I'll admit it's not my forte. Mm -hmm. I I've gone on a couple ghost hunting trips. Mm -hmm. It doesn't resonate with me, mm -hmm. but what I find interesting is that before the team does anything, you know, I mean, oftentimes they'll, they'll front load themselves. Yeah. They'll, they'll front load themselves saying, we're going to go there. We're going to experience ghosts. We're going to do this. If this has a history of this and that, we might see this, we might see that. They're sort of preloading themselves with stuff that they expect to see. And then they go through the thing, and if they don't see what they expect to see, then they're like, oh, this, nothing happened here. We didn't mm -hmm. experience anything. Mm -hmm. Or something completely different happens, mm -hmm. and they're like, whoa, we didn't see that happening. But mm -hmm. I just find it curious that, um, you know, I'm not saying all paranormal groups do this, like you were alluding to earlier, that the more seasoned uh, ghost hunt or the more more seasoned paranormal groups, mm -hmm. they try not to front load themselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just go in there with a blank slate. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really think more groups should do that because yeah. it's it's just – you know, you're you're sort of you're you're hyping yourself up to you're giving yourself a confirmation bias, mm -hmm. and with what's different with the the crypto hunting and the UFO stuff is we're not trying to make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We're trying to investigate stuff that already happened, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah, you can't interview. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't interview a UFO. So we can just go to the place where people saw it and, you know, gather evidence and get testimonial evidence and stuff like that. That's the best that we can do. We mm-hmm. can't, you know, interview a Bigfoot. We have to just go where he was and take uh, samples and, and, and get a uh, uh, footprint. What do they call it? Casting. We have to get mm-hmm. casting of footprints and we have to just take care of all this stuff. And it's like, and with the, with the, the ghost stuff that I find is so curious, it's almost kind of backwards where you're going there because you, you're going there to investigate something that you expect to happen. Mm-hmm. And then it's you know? so and, hard to get that to happen again. And a lot of, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, sometimes we got to tap the brakes a little bit here, you know, because I've said this for, for multiple years. I have a scenario that I describe, and it's basically, I think that we took a lot of the feeling out of it. When you're dealing with paranormal and supernatural, you know, it really does have so much to do with your own uh, feelings. Like we're talking in the beginning of our conversation here about your, your natural intuition, you know, the vibe, you know, the vibration, the frequency, the whole, everything, it's the whole package. Um, and I love the equipment. I don't understand a lot of it, but I think that's really, you know, really cool. I don't understand how something can take a vibration from an entity and turn it into a word and spell it. I, I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying I just don't understand it. I've seen it Mm -hmm. work and I've seen that piece of equipment match to this one and what I was feeling. So that kind of validated a little bit for me, but I don't understand it. But when you go into a house, um, what kills me is, uh, like the people at the house, first of all, ghosts aren't pets. You know, if it is a human being <laughs> and if it is a human being and it and it's a human being that's stuck for whatever reason or confused for whatever reason, that human being has every right to some help and not a bunch of, you know, hooey, you know, if the, if it if that's what's happening. So you go into a household and they say, um, here's one particular, there's a hotel and the princess used to stay and I forget where it is, it's in Washington State. Um, and they always leave a table for her and they do all this and they talk to her and, you know, they leave an empty spot for her to come sit and they say, oh, it's the princess. Everything that happens, if somebody drops a spoon, the princess did that, you know, this happened <laughs> and they start saying these things. Well, homeowners do this too. And they say, oh, well, you know, we just call him Jack because Jack died on a, in a tractor accident, you know, and 20 years ago is to be a farm and they have this whole thing for him, you know, and they, just, and they just, and we talk to him, he's like a family member and I'm like, well, hold on. So you go in there with the, the paranormal investigation group, fully well-educated, great tech, well-intentioned. They've done some history on the property. Yes, Jack did die there. Um you know, uh, all this other stuff. Now, if you take any of the feeling out of you, take away the mediums and the psychics and the sensitives, and you take out everything else, you're just running tech. You could get, uh, a class, a EVP that says, help me. Um, and then you can get like a, an apparition, you know, running through your laser grid, full on apparition. That still doesn't prove it's Jack, you know? Mm. Um, you're going to get, you know, it could be a male voice. It could be a high frequency voice. The frequency's changed. doesn't matter. Um, and then you tell this homeowner, okay, well, you know, you definitely have somebody here, you know, the little girl, like she's seeing a little girl and the little girl in the bedroom is probably Mary. She died of smallpox a long time ago and blah, blah, blah. However, you could get all of that evidence And you still don't know unless that guy comes through and says, yes, I'm Jack and I died in a tractor accident and I'm here because I'm not leaving. It's my house, whatever. Unless you get something like that, you still don't know, was that really Jack or is that just somebody wants you to get the hell out of there so it can continue doing what it's doing? Because why would you believe it? You know, there's so many things, but if you put everything Mm -hmm. together. And you don't tell the medium or psychic when they come in there any of this history. And they walk through and they go, okay, Jack did die in a tractor accident, but he crossed. He's good. You know, what you're seeing in this house is someone who died in a massacre on the land before. Somebody died in a car accident four miles away. And somebody in this house has um, abilities and it's drawn this way or just hanging out. 
um, the little girl you see in, that's not a little girl. That's something that's manifesting as a little girl. Do you see what I mean? You could get all of yeah. this evidence, okay? I think it all should be used. Because I remember ghost hunters come on. They started saying, this was 10, 11, 12, maybe 15 years ago now when they first started. And they said, we're doing all science. We're not doing any feelings. We don't care what we feel or if it feels creepy. We're not using any of that. But we're going to get all of this. And then they'd come in and tell these people time after time. And that's one of the most, the, the shows that I, I dislike the most, you know, the least. Because they were at least decent about it. But they would sit down and tell these people at the reveal well, you know, you've got this ghost and we don't think there's anything harmful here. So, you know, we think you should just continue and everything is fine. And well, what is that? You have no <laughs> clue what you're telling this homeowner, you know, that everything is fine and okay. You know, or what your little kid is talking to, you know, that's in his closet is really, oh, he's not harmful. He's just a guy that wants to hang out in the closet. What? You know, what are you doing? <laughs> but you see what I mean? Yeah. That whole there, there are scenario. so many there are so many variables yes. in uh, paranormal that that side of paranormal. Yes, because it's like it's very difficult to create a truly sterile environment. Yes, for science, and that's what science requires. Mm -hmm. Because let's be honest, how many ghost hunters? You know, how many of them are bringing something with them? Mm -hmm. And you've also heard of the Philip experiment, yes. which was you know it was like that was a manifestation like people willed a ghost into existence. Who knows mm -hmm. how many times that's happened? Right. And how I've talked about have, that flip coin yeah. on it too. I mean, how do you know yeah. that Philip really didn't exist and was, and it was affecting them to the thoughts that would benefit. You know, that's what I think about slender band too. We go back and forth with that one all the time. Was oh, it yeah, a tulpa yeah. Yeah. or was that, you know, an entity standing behind that guy that said, you know, this, and that's where he got the idea from it's chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah and there's just so many variables there and, and and i i i try i'm intrigued but i try i try to keep my distance but every now and then i'll i'll poke in a, a toe every now and then <laughs> <Poking> a toe. <laughs> and sometimes you get your toe poked in there too without knowing about yes. it because one day you're gonna you know, <laughs> bang into something you're gonna go okay am i manifesting that it, it it can make you crazy if you try to figure yes. that out as far as that goes, because like I said, just talking about the Slender Man, was that really, did you ever hear, oh, one of Steve's favorites is, oh gosh, uh, uh, The Shadow Knows. Okay, the author who wrote that is an old radio show, if you recall, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but it was an old radio oh, yes, show, yes, The yes, Shadow yes, Knows, The yeah, Shadow I, Knows, with the I, laugh. I know where you're going. Okay, and then yeah. he starts seeing him in his apartment, New York apartment. And then he used to oh, no. like to throw dinner parties and things like that. And those people would start saying, so was that a tulpa? Did he create uh, this guy? Wow. I, I think what the what the story was, was that after the author left, he left, these, 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 he left this impression mm -hmm. of the shadow. And people would see the shadow and the many stories play out in the apartment wow. after he left. Wow. And... And that's, that's, that's what I heard. Yeah. And that would and be that very much like that. our couple in the, uh, in the hallway kind of sort of, except mm -hmm. that they, these things never existed. Supposedly they were made up mm. characters. Wow. I know that Steve likes to say after that one, can you imagine what Stephen King's house is like with all the stuff that he comes up with? <laughs> How scary <laughs> that would be if that's going to happen. Isn't that interesting, though? There's just so many yeah. things to this, Chris. And I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. And I know there was other things that we wanted to get to. Oh, um, yeah. How yes, about, how, I... wouldn't you, would you come back? Oh, I'd love to come back. Oh, please do. I would love to talk yeah. about uh, the native aspect and some of the, uh, I would love to get you back to talk about some of your favorite cryptids and, you know, which ones you think that really do exist and which ones you think that are just, you know, um, maybe a manifestation of our own thoughts or, you know, what we've come up with. But uh, I'd love to have you back on. I really would. So let's do it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Absolutely. let's tell, where can we find you? And I want to find out what the heck is with crop circles. So when you come <laughs> back, I want to know what the heck is going on with the crop circles. It seems to be so many, it used to be so much more. And now I'm not, I don't know if we're just not hearing about it or has it eased off or 
Are they tired of leaving us signals? What's going on there? Yeah. <laughs> We're not paying attention. They don't, they don't. They don't seem to be trending as much as they used to. Yeah, they're not leaving us love notes anymore. If that's what they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they need to make they what they what they need to do is turn the crop circles into QR codes, so that way people can just scan them with their phones. <laughs> yeah, scan them with their phones and figure out what are they trying to say to us. We're really here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just send us. Just send it to their Etsy store, you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. Well, tell us where we can find you again. UFO Encrypted Investigations. Yeah. U okay. uh, UFO Encrypted Investigations San Antonio is on Facebook. Okay. Just search for it. You should be able to find it very easily. Okay. My personal um, my personal uh Facebook or or there is a Facebook page for Conspire a Theory. Just search Conspire a Theory, all separate words podcast, and it'll come up. There will be a group and a page specifically for the podcast. I am on Podomatic. You just search Podomatic.com backslash Conspire Theory. That should take you directly to me. And you know, it's I have lots of different shows. I try to categorize them. So make sure that before you listen to a show. Please say make sure that it's not a fandom, paranormal, or uh, hot topics because they're all completely different shows. <laughs> if you like, uh, if you like talking about superheroes and stuff like that, you're going to go to the fandom stuff. If you like talking about paranormal stuff, like me and Cisco just did, more of that type of stuff, you're going to go into paranormal. If you're going to look for uh, me talking about how much I hate the View <laughs> and, and get into <laughs> oh, too, nasty man. politics and Oh, and hear gosh. me cuss, and then you're going to go into hot topics. And yeah. I, I, there is several content warnings on hot topics. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that the, the <laughs> boy, we're going to, but I don't think I don't know. I don't think my listeners are, are the View fans. I wouldn't say that they probably are, but that is the scariest two words you've said in the past two hours to me. <laughs> 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 I really it's... think that they could probably use that as a form of torture. You know, if they wanted, to, if they wanted to ever get anything out of me, just put that show on. I'm like, what do you want to know, man? Just tell me now. I'll get it, get me out of this room. I can't, I can't stand it. I'm not real big uh, into the talking heads on TV. I mean, I can't yeah. even do the news. I really can't. You know, I figure if something big is going to happen, I'm going to know it. Somebody's going to tell me I don't need it. You know, it's just too much negativity. You know what I mean? I, I understand, and a lot of it is. Um, we we we're all when when it comes to the social media stuff, it's we're pitting ourselves against each other, mm -hmm. and we don't have to. Mm -mm. Before, social media was a great unifier. It was a great way to connect with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. And now we have we've all somehow made this conscious decision that politics is more important than personability. Yeah. That, you know, I've I've built so many friendships on the foundation of of united fandom stuff mm -hmm. and and that is just turned away because you know either i i don't hate whatever they hate as much as they do mm -hmm. so because of that i'm i need to be cut from their lives yeah and i i it saddened me so much yeah. and that's why i'm so glad that in the paranormal we a lot of us try to keep politics out of it yeah. sometimes it seeps in Sometimes with with uh, with the space force, it kind of seeps in, mm -hmm. but that's only because it happened during Trump's administration. Yeah. If it happened during Obama's administration or a past president's administration, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be such an issue. But anything paranormal related happening now has that you know nasty political stink yeah. on it, and it becomes a divisive issue when it really isn't. Yeah. If we take a closer look at it. And, you know, and I, I got, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm squeaky clean. Mm -hmm. I have my positions. If you listen to any of the hot topic shows, it's mm -hmm. dark humor. I get myself in the mud as much as anyone else. And I'm not trying to say that I don't, but yeah. it's just, you know, I'm, I'm I totally out there understand. with it. I totally understand, man. I was like, I'm, I'm more, I'm more of a, a nature person. It's like, I look outside and the squirrels and the trees and the deers that are drinking from the lake outside my house, they don't care who's president or who isn't or whatever. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It's like everything just keeps, you know, trudging on. You know, I just, I believe in right. I believe in kindness. I believe love conquers all things and, oh, oh, and I, good before, energy. Before we, yeah, Absolutely. Before we go, I got to ask you something. Sure. Uh, what are you doing for, are, are you celebrating Wolf and Newt? 
I don't even know what that is. Oh my god! Is it gosh, something I, I can drink? Is there something I can drink <laughs> beer to? Because I'll celebrate it. <laughs> oh my god! I can, you gotta. You know, you know how like uh, Thanksgiving has pretty much evolved into Family Turkey Day, right? And I'm all for that. I love that. Okay. Well, some a seven year old he created a new holiday called Wolfenute. Okay. And basically, it's he made up this lore where it's you. It's like you celebrate the spirit of the wolf and you celebrate it by giving gifts to your dogs and stuff like that. Oh, how cool. And it's supposed to be, and, and you eat roasted beef because wolves eat roasted beef because oh. wolves eat meat. So oh. you eat, you celebrate by eating roasted beef and it's, it's like you're supposed to celebrate the sort of the, the, the primal spirit of the wolf. That's beautiful. And it is, it's, it's so cute. It's beautiful. And it's basically, it's like, it's like, you know, hashtag, you know, stop hate only nose boops. And it's just, Beautiful. It, it's like, yeah, it just takes a sort of this, this innocence and it plugs it in. Like, it's spelled Wolf W O L F E N O O T. Look it up. It's coming on the 23rd, which is going to be, you know, you can either have your black Friday or you can celebrate Wolf and Newt. Wolf and Newt. I'm going to be celebrating. Well, now Wolf I have to go out and buy dog gifts for all the dogs in the neighborhood. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to do it. If we're going to celebrate an animal, I'm there. You know, I mean, I think that's beautiful. I think that's a beautiful thing. Except now we're going to have to have something for the cats because <laughs> they will retaliate. I know them. I've yeah. seen them do it. <laughs> I think that's any, wonderful. Any kind, of, yeah. any kind of pet or love yeah. for animals should fall under that category. Good, good, good. <laughs> Thanks. My cat just heard that and expecting gifts now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and he will get them. I promise you he will get them. I think that's wonderful. Well, it's been wonderful having you on, Chris. I can't wait uh, to get you back on. And uh, I just think it's been fantastic. Um, like I said, you know, we'll get you on here and just do a solid cryptid show. You know, so get all your, your crypt, favorite cryptids together. Um, I don't know if you ever heard, um, my, mine and Steve, we did a two-parter on monsters. And oh, you, yes. you might be yes. interested in hearing that because, boy, we went through the gauntlet. And maybe you can tell me how in the world Wolfman turned into Dogman. I don't know. Is it the same two things? Is it just <laughs> evolved? I don't know what's happened. He used to be such yeah, a snappy I, dresser. And now, you know, now it's just Dogman naked out in the woods. I don't get it. But uh, I, I got a lecture on that. Don't do worry you? about it. I got cool. a lecture. I would love to hear it. I would love to hear it. So thanks so much for being on. It's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful. Oh, thank you, sweetie. And let me know if you do read the book. Um, if, if you want to wait for the paperback, I'll send you a, an autographed copy and you can read it that way. It's fun. You know, it's, it's oh, my experiences. Fantastic. Yeah, it's just my experiences and it's how I saw them. You know, I could be I might have to put out a second one and go, you know what? It was it was it was it was the gin the whole time <laughs> it really or aliens aliens did it thank uh, you sweetie have a wonderful blessed evening and a wolf and newt to you happy thank wolf you. And newt. A wonderful wolf and you newt. Too. <laughs> <laughs> good night thank you so much listeners i hope you enjoyed that one and uh since this is coming out right before the holidays um you know However you celebrate that, I'm going to wish you uh, a happy Thanksgiving. Please remember Native Americans were there too. Um, and, uh, you know, Merry Christmas. Um, I think it's uh, happy holidays, uh, all the different holidays you ce celebrate. And now we've got the wonderful, uh, have a wonderful Wufanut. Um, it sounds much nicer, so I guess Black Friday, make sure you buy something for your animals and I guess eat roast beef. I don't know what the decorations are for that, but we'll have to look into it. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Chris Holmes for coming on. A very interesting conversation. And don't forget, if you're looking for some fun gifts or some stocking stuffers, head on over to the tpublic.com um, backslash user backslash Cisco, or just hit the link at the bottom. I'm telling you what the hoodies are happening. Um, I'm really glad that they have the zipper front with the logo on the back. Now you can get that. You can get it in the heavy or the light, which is nice. Um, you have to go over to the side and hit the arrow down when you get into hoodies and it'll give you the choice on that. 
They're all on sale right now. It's 30% off. The mugs are beautiful. Uh, I know many people that have gotten them. Um, the uh, travel mugs, also same thing. When you go to coffee mug, go to the arrow on the side and, you know, go down and it'll give you a choice for the travel mug. Looks really good with the with the crispy um, Journey Through the Gate logo on it. It's really nice. Um, stickers, posters, canvas notebooks, regular notebooks, uh, onesies for the kids. No, we do not have them in adult size. I'm sorry. I guess they might be, they might be working on that. So also I'm going to, uh, send in, as Chris is now sending me links to, uh, Wolfenoot, which is November 23rd. I think it's lovely. Um, pass that along. Let's get this holiday going that's really cool that a, a young boy came up with that. I think that's pretty neat. So, um, yeah, remember the animals. That's nice. Um, also, what else do we have? Journey Through the Gate, uh, Paranormal Portal Podcast, Gatekeepers on Facebook. Come on over, join us, um, get your, you know, discussion on. Uh, send us your ghost pictures, your stories. If you do have your own story, Journey Through the Gate at gmail.com or or hit me up on um, the Facebook page. Let me know. We are compiling listener stories, episodes. Um, what else? Oh, share the podcast. Also, thank you for listening. That is the most important thing. Uh, share it with your friends. Um, also, the book is out. We are all children in the wilderness of the afterlife. A guided tour through a haunted life. And it's my life. So I wrote about it um, because it was the one I knew and it was my experiences. And I give you the best version of the story as far as my memory. If I don't remember something, I'll tell you. I forget what, you know, whatever. I'm as honest as I can possibly be. Um, it's It's hard to write about your own life and put some of that stuff in there um but these things happen man you know um we have guests on and I tell people you know I don't know what's happening in this certain situation or this certain situation but in there I explain to you why I came to the conclusions I did and sometimes I just say look this is what happened I don't have a clue what it was what do you think so it's left up to you uh, to decide. And, you know, we, I try to mention all the different things it could be. Um, but then again, you might look at it and see it another way. So, um, I've been getting a lot of good feedback and, um, a lot of good thank you for everybody who read it and wrote a review on Kindle and Goodreads, um, and sent me, uh, your feedback on it. People are really enjoying it. And I thank you very much for that. It's uh, co-written with Steve Stockton, and it's done in a way where he comes in after my chapter. It's not together um, that we both wrote the story. He comes in and he adds in his um, anecdotes and quips and all of his thoughts about what might have happened to and, um, you know, Steve, he's just funny as all get out. So it makes it very enjoy enjoyable, kind of a color commentary. And that is available right now. It's uh, introductory price. It's $7.99 on Kindle. You can give that as a gift, as an ebook. We are working on the printed copy. Hopefully it will be out by Christmas. Um, so you can have a paper copy and I will work out a way where you can start getting them from me and I will uh, certainly autograph them for you. So that is all coming up and also I will be at Paracon signing and stuff like that. I've got one coming up in Gettysburg, another Gettysburg bash. So hopefully we'll have them for you then. So that pretty much covers everything. I can't think of anything else other than please share the podcast. Thank you so, so much for listening and passing it along. Um, it's gone beyond my expectations. I mean, we've got listeners all over the world. Downloads are incredible. Um, it's just wonderful. We are on Conflict Radio on YouTube as well. We are also on Black Swamp Digital Radio. And, of course, always here on um, the Lipson.com, Journey Through the Gate, Paranormal Podcast, Portal Podcast on Lipson.com. So thank you so much for listening. Um, 
it's been incredible. It's been so fast. We've only been up a couple of months and we're, or this is already episode 36. So that's all because of you guys. And if you can, like I said, we're not doing Patreon right now. We're not doing anything. This podcast is free, um, for your listening pleasure. So go in there to, uh, tpublic.com, maybe grab a couple stickers or whatever. We just get a small, uh, amount of that and it does help to keep this podcast on the air and keep it free to you because I'd always like to keep it free and not hold back any content um, if you notice sometimes they're an hour sometimes they're three hours it is what it is and uh, if these people want to talk and have a long conversation sometimes the real good stories come in you know the last half hour so I don't cut them out and I don't edit it you know you get it for what it is and um, so there you go Thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful holiday season. We've got some wonderful things coming up. I've got Simon at Whistle coming back to uh, tell us uh, some of Britain's best Christmas ghost stories. And I've got some other good surprises too. So as always, uh, I love each and every one of you and I appreciate you. And um, just remember, keep your feet under those covers and keep your closet door shut. Because there are things that go bump in the night. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm.